Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert K. And you may want to forget it later, but that's okay. Uh, that's I figured you already have. Uh, so today I am going to be speaking on the Zohar of the Book of Mormon. Um, the word Zohar means really okay. I don't project very well. I need some help here. There we go. How's that? Much better. Much better? Okay. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the Zohar of the Book of Mormon. And when we talk about the word Zohar, it means brilliance or radiance. And the idea of this goes back to ancient Israel. When we speak of Israel, we're talking about a people with a relationship to God, specifically the four letter name of God, Yod Hevavhe. We talk about specifically, often meaning the prophet Moses, because he led Israel out of bondage. We try to think about the deliverance of the people. But we also often do not think of something that has been right in front of our eyes, but has been given to us as a very holy gift. And that is the science of Israel. This is one of those things that over time has been either lost hidden, or in all reality, um, misunderstood. Because there are many people who have partaken of the, the living waters of the tree of life. And they tout their particular teachings as being uh, from ancient Israel. Sometimes you'll, you'll, I call them the New Age version of Kabbalah, or some very New Age teachings. But while they may have partaken of certain aspects of the living waters that proceed forth, from the tree of life, their understanding is very incomplete and has also divorced itself from the Torah. So first we need to understand that when we're talking about the science of Israel, we're gonna be talking about the knowledge of the fathers. These are the science, and I could use other words. We could talk about the, uh, the, the discipline of receiving from God to bestow upon others. We talk about, um, spiritual consciousness. But either way, whatever we choose to define it, in our modern culture, I find that the term science or technology serves us best because it also gives us an idea or a principle, but it also gives us a practical tool from God that was meant to be communicated to us, that we were meant to practice. However, because of our cultural estrangement from the house of Israel, we didn't even know it existed. So Israel stands as a nexus between our current age, and the knowledge of the fathers. Now, by the fathers, we can often refer to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But at the same time, these same fathers could be referred to as Adam, Enoch, Noah, Seth, all of the original patriarchs. That's what we're aiming for. Israel stands as a preserver or as a nexus between our modern world and their ancient world. Because our goal is not, at the end of the day, just Israel, but it's the covenant society that God preserved through the house of Israel. And now we need help doing that because we can have talks all day long. We can meet every year at a conference and we can rehearse these things, which are good to rehearse. But unless we understand the technology and the science that God has made available to us, we will never have the grace and the power to establish these things on this world. And that is what true priesthood is. It takes that which is above and manifests it here below. We bring from heaven and we bring it on earth, we connect the two. So just like Abraham, and finding there was a greater happiness and peace and rest for me, 
I sought for the blessings of the fathers and the right whereunto I should be ordained to administer the same. Having been myself a follower of righteousness, desiring also to be one who possessed great knowledge and to be a greater follower of righteousness and to possess a greater knowledge and to be a father of many nations, a prince of peace and desiring to receive instructions, to receive instructions, Havilah, to receive. A prince, this is, um, and to keep the commandments of God, I became a rightful heir, a high priest holding the right belonging to the fathers. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of this science. Science we call it Yatsira, formation, the science of formation. This isn't the science of creation, of something out of nothing. This is a science of organization. We're taking matter from one thing, matter from another thing, and then converting it to matter in this world. A science that it was given to the priesthood of God in all generations. It's the science of us. To understand some of these things, we need some of the knowledge of the symbols. To the left there, you see uh, the tree of life. In the center, you see a human man, or it could be a woman. And on the right, you see a, a, a basically a diagram or an interpretation of what we call the tree of life, the Sephirotic tree. But in either case, make no mistake, you are the tree. God is the tree. We're all a part of that same tree. It consists of a knowledge of the first civilization. You know, while many of uh, the while many of the, the science that we receive these days has wants you to believe that we evolved from basically a, a fish all the way into a monkey into a man, the understanding of ancient Israel is that the first civilization had direct access to God. We're talking about a very advanced civilization, a civilization whose whose very science and understanding of technology was not one of mechanical, metal, steel, grinding motors, industrial age. It's one of intelligence, grace, wisdom, consciousness, spirit. They had the ability to transcend and not only this world, but to draw the upper worlds down. This is what we're trying to get back to. So you'll see some of these things. You'll see some of these symbols, even in the very first creation in Genesis, day one. A point within a circle. Day two, the Vesic of Pisces, the boom of creation. Until we go all the way through day seven and we get to the flower of life. And we see on our right hand, we see geometric symbols such as Metatron's cube, sometimes called Enix cube. At the same time, we see the star decahedron. And of course, that same symbol, the tree of life or the seed of life. These things are couched in symbolic format in the creation process of the book of Genesis. From very verse one, all the way through the 10 decrees of creation in Genesis. You will see these same declarations as you go through Genesis parable. When you see something repeated 10 times, you know you're at the tree of life. Pay attention in the scriptures. Things are placed there specifically. They're not by accident. So when we talk about this science, we're also talking about a geometric science, a science of life. Even the nature of ourselves patterns itself in this same eternal pattern. So like I said, whether we call it, we express these things from one culture, such as Metatron's cube, the flower of life, or the star of David, they're all basically the same symbols expressing the same thought and understanding of a multidimensional world. This multidimensional world is the world that God lives in. In which we are a part of. So when we see these symbols that are often right in front of us, do we take them for granted? Well, you know, the scriptures were written in a certain pattern. They're written according to a certain code. So when you say Nephi is building a ship, is he really building a ship? You bet he is. But is he also building something else and teaching you how to do it? Is he actually have a liahona, a ball? with two spindles in it? Or is he also teaching you something about the tree of life, which has two pillars in it, two spindles, mercy, truth? When we talk about Ezekiel and his wheels within wheels, are we talking about a literal chariot or are we talking about a Merkava, a vehicle of light? But the whole goal at the end is to reach a state of on earth as it is in heaven. 
We want to replicate heaven here on earth. And we see these things in many of our ancient cultures. But specifically, the prophet I want us to pay attention to is the one that really seems to get the most attention in the Israelite world, Enoch. Whether he's called Toth in Egypt, Edris in Islam, Hanoch in Israel, or Hermes Trismegistus in Greek, you're basically talking about the same person and the same teachings. They may be expressed differently. But in his true Emerald Tablet, not the channel text that you see out there these days, but what we have of the true Emerald Tablet, which exemplifies the seven laws of heaven, which are the seven laws upon which the Torah functions and is based upon. Yes. You bet. Sorry. That's okay. That's good to know. I appreciate that. So whether we're talking about Enoch, Hermes Trismegistus, Toth, or Edris, we're talking about the same person. This was the person that we attribute the creation of a Zion here on earth. And yet, we only hear a fraction, understand a fraction of what he was truly teaching. And in doing so, we miss out on some of the most important laws. So either way, when we, when we take a look at these ancient laws, I will guarantee you, I'm going to enumerate them from the Hebrew text of the seven laws of Enoch. However, you will find them both in Islam, you will find them in Egypt, you will find them in Greece. Seven laws by which the Torah itself functions and by which creation functions. And here they are. All is spirit and mind. As above, so below. So below, as so above. You could also say as within, so without. That's one of the other translations. Nothing rests. Everything moves. Everything is in motion. Everything is dual. There are opposites in all things. Sounds like a little bit like Lehi. There is a rhythm in all things. Like a tide, there is an ebb, like a pendulum. In other words, to everything there is a season. There is a cause for every effect. And there is the masculine and feminine principles ever at work. In other words, you will always have a masculine and feminine principle present. Just like with the tree of life has two pillars. You have a masculine pillar and you have a feminine pillar. It's like you have a man and woman. Everything follows a pattern. And if we understand that pattern, we can begin to unlock the secrets of the, that the ancients meant for us to find. So what we want to understand is that the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. But that means a little bit more than we think. It has reference to a very ancient knowledge, the knowledge of ascension and the knowledge of the tree of life. We're talking about Alia, the path of ascending. And when someone talks in these days about making Alia, they're talking about returning to Israel. But originally Alia was not just about returning to Israel, the land. It was about the idea of going to the temple of God to ascend into the presence of God or the idea of ascending into heaven. So to understand this, we have to understand that God takes a multidimensional approach. Even our very scriptures are written in a multidimensional pro approach. So when you see these, these pictures here, what do you see? Do you see a young lady or do you see an old woman? Um, do you see a triangle or do you see a multidimensional figure? And the answer is yes. Hebrew is just like this. We look oftentimes in the scriptures for concrete, absolute definitions, and they are there. But it's meant to paint a picture. The very words we read are meant to paint a picture. They give us multidimensional aspects, something that we're to understand. So the revelations of God are, layers, are layered, and they follow a system of interpretation we call pardons. And in this case, pardis is peshat, the simple or literal meaning word of the account. In other words, if Nephi built a boat, he really built a boat. Okay? If he really crossed the wilderness, it means he literally crossed the wilderness. So that's literally what it means. No mistaking. What you read is what you get. That's the story. The second level is remez. This is the allegorical or symbolic meaning of the word or the account. Um, I often tell people that Abraham Gileadi probably touches on this the most in his work with Isaiah, is that what has been shall be using types and shadows. But at the same time, 
It's a technique where you will quote a portion of a scripture to refer the reader back to the scripture from which the original scripture <laughs> was meant to be found. So they'll quote a portion to lead you back to the original. And oftentimes it's all through the text and you're reading it and you're reading right over it. But then if you stop for a second and it says, you know, hearken or hero Israel, what am I referring to? Hearken, hear, hero Israel, Shema, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 4. <laughs> but either way, at the end of the day, the idea is these are techniques that lead us back to something. The other meaning is the word of drash. Drash, like we call them like drash. After, after a Sabbath session, we'll drash, we'll sit around and talk. We'll often talk about referring to other teachers. In specific, it's the, it's the drawing upon another teacher's work to exemplify something to us. And a classical example of this would be Jacob's drawing upon the writings of the prophet Zenos in the allegory of the olive tree or the vineyard. That's an example of drashing. He's pulling from another prophet's teachings to teach something to his people and to us. Then, of course, the fourth level is what we call so. It, it literally regards the secret or the esoteric or the mystical meaning. But specifically, these are the hidden things of God that have to do with the counsel of heaven. Now, if anybody tells you that they can reveal to you the so level of meaning, run the other way because they can't. No one can. We can touch on keys to access the so level of meaning. But the soul level of the scriptures has to be experienced. It has to be experienced by direct revelation and coming into the presence of God. So if a person says to you that they are uh, going to reveal you all these mysteries, um, the most they could really do is teach you about the keys to access them. But they can never give you the experience that has to come from God himself. So this is what we call, this whole principle part is that this layered meaning has to do with what we call rending the veil of unbelief. Come unto me, O you Gentiles, and I will show unto you the greater things which knowledge is hid up because of unbelief. Come unto me, O you house of Israel, it shall be manifest, it shall be made manifest unto you how, how great things the Father hath laid up for you from the foundation of the world. And it hath not come unto you because of unbelief. Behold, when you shall rend that veil of unbelief, which has caused you to remain in your awful state of wickedness and hardness of heart and blindness of mind, then you shall then shall the great and marvelous things which have been hid up from the foundation of the world. And that word, foundation of the world, does not mean what you think it means. It, while it does mean from the creation, the word foundation is just so. It's talking about the tree of life. Those things which have been connected to the tree of life will be made manifest unto you says, yes, when you shall call upon the Father in my name. How do we call upon the Father? In our culture, we have talked about calling upon the Father, and we fold our arms, and we know the Father, bless so and so, and that's okay. That's great. I think that's great with your Father. But as we mature, prayer should mature. It should become more than just a five-year-old folding their arms. It should become a connective process between our, ourselves and our Father. Not one of pleading, Daddy, I want a cookie, give me a car, give me this, give me that, or like a teenager, but one of receiving God, allowing him to reveal himself to us in the manner he chooses, instead of the manner, like a child, I want what I want what I want. It's just that simple. But when we talk about the veil of unbelief, understand that the Peshat level of meaning, the literal level in Israel is called your veil of unbelief. Now, is it bad? No. A veil is meant to conceal something of great beauty. The veil is beauty itself. But if you read it just at the literal level, then that's all you'll ever see. And it is very beautiful. But understand that the Zohar, the radiance or the brilliance of the Book of Mormon, is behind the actual words. It's the story behind the story, the symbolic story, the prophetic story. Those are the greater things. This is why the Book of Mormon itself is still a still a sealed book, because we have not, it has not been made aware fully to our understanding. But hopefully today we will explore some of these gifts that are given in the Book of Mormon, and you'll see for yourself. And then you can go explore for yourself, because you won't be dependent upon any other person. You will know it's there, and you can begin to explore it. So, like I said, the Peshat level is the veil, the literal level, beautiful veil. You know, but do I want the veil or do I want the beautiful woman behind the veil? I don't know. Now, both are beautiful, but the beautiful woman behind the veil 
That's the garden of delights. And that's not mean bad. That, that's literally what is considered in Israel. A woman is considered the garden of delight. She is the garden of Eden. And I know it sounds strange to us, but she is the, she is the beauty of God. And so the idea is when Moses came down from the, from the mountain, from Sinai, he had to veil his face. When he had to veil his face, they could not stand to look upon him because his radiance with his Zohar was so brilliant, he couldn't even look upon him. He veiled it, and after every minute's forth, it came to be an idiomatic expression called walking in the veil of unbelief. Why? Because they couldn't stand the full radiance of God. They were only willing to receive the veil. And like I said, the veil is beautiful. But it it restricts us from seeing the beautiful beauty and the radiance of God's word and the greater things that he has promised us. So let's take a look at an example from the Book of Mormon, an example of one of, just one of these ancient teachings in the Book of Mormon. And it's Nephi and Laban, Levi, obtaining the record of heaven. Nephi was sent to, or sent back, and uh, he, when he was sent back, he was sent to obtain the record of heaven. Now, the Book of Mormon follows the pattern of the Tree of Life. Just like Enoch talked about earlier, about the four worlds, I believe he said something like that, or the four levels. There are four worlds. Almost exactly in Hebrew. We start out at Asia. We start it, then we go to uh, Yetzirah, and then we go to Baria, and then we go to Atzerud. Or you could say perdition, terrestrial, 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 celestial. Same symbols too. Same concept behind it. But so when we look at the Book of Mormon, if we pay very close attention, Nephi leaves us what we call prophetic markers. This is part of the science of ancient Israel that was passed down. One of the first, first terms you should know, and my father dwelt in a tent. When you see that phraseology, the, the word tent is related to the temple or the tent of the dwelling, Mishkan, Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. This is a teaching related specifically to the house. That little statement, and my father dwelt in a tent, was not put there by accident. It's a prophetic marker that he's about to give you a very ancient teaching regarding the knowledge of the fathers. We're going to talk about the first one, 1 Nephi 2.15. So Lehi sends his kids, <laughs> his sons, back to the rectitude of Tetu Laban to obtain the record of the Jews. But the Torah, the Tanakh, is an earthly manifestation of a record that exists in heaven. It is the record of heaven. And what do we have for this? The record of heaven. Therefore, it is given to abide in you the record of heaven, the comforter, the peaceful things of immortal glory, the truth of all things, that which quickens all things, which makes alive all things, which knows all things, and hath all power according to wisdom, mercy, truth, justice, and judgment. Many of the things that Enoch talked about earlier today. These are the elements of the tree of life. And now, behold, I say unto you, this is the plan of salvation unto all men, through the blood of mine, own, of mine only begotten, or I could even say in Hebrew, the blood of Zeran Pen, the small face of God, the heart of the tree of life, who shall come in the meridian of time. And behold, all things have their likeness, and things that are created are made to bear record of me, both things which are temporal, things which are spiritual, things which are in the heavens above, and things which are on the earth. Things which are in the earth, things which are under the earth, both above and beneath, all things bear record of me. Oh my gosh, what did we see? The first law of Enoch. As above, so below. Right in there, one of the laws of Enoch built right into it. Actually, I think it's the second law. I think it like that. Notice what Joseph Smith stated. I thank God that I have got this old book, but I thank him more for the gift of the Holy Ghost. I have got the oldest book in the world, but I have got the oldest book in my heart, even the gift of the Holy Ghost. So think about it. We're here. The very first lesson is we are sent to obtain the record of heaven. The Torah is your physical manifestation of that. But now he's leading us to the ancient level, what it meant to understand and retain the real record of heaven. In Hebrew, the name Lavan, Lavan means white. In the teachings of ancient Israel, Lavan represents that which is called Lavan Ha'eleon, or the heavenly or celestial whiteness. The name Lavan represents the power of transformation. He represents the opposition, the opposition needed to help you transform. His, his house is the location where the conflict to obtain the record of heaven takes place. 
His name has to do with the transformation from one extreme state to another, like coal into a diamond. Levan is a symbol of a mighty one, an angelic being. So what do we have happening here? Laman, Lemuel, Nephi, and Sam all go and they attempt to attain first the record of heaven, or the, just say the record of the Jews. What do they do first? They first go approach him, and by reason of lineage, they have a right to obtain the record because they're in the house of Manasseh. And what does he do? He kicks them out. You're a thief and a robber, kicks them out. Then they go obtain their family idols, their gold and their silver, the things that gave them standing in their culture, and they take back. And what do they try to do? They try to buy it. What does he do? He sends his servants to take away their wealth, strips them of everything that gives them any standing whatsoever, and kicks them out. Yes, you can't get it by lineage, and I guess you can't, there's no way by either any form of idol, wealth, station, or whatnot that you can obtain this particular record. And where do they go? They go into a cavity of a rock. In Hebrew, the cavity of a rock is a place of correction, whether it be Elijah in a cave, or Nephi and his brothers in a cavity of the rock, this is the rock. This is your place of correction. It's a symbol for the skull. That's why you see in Golgotha, the place of the skull. Same symbol. You're going to see a lot of symbols carried over from one testament to another. But when you look at this, he's giving you a process. You have to, this is, you're not going to defeat the mighty one. Whatever the mighty one is in your life, we are not going to defeat that mighty one with something outside of ourselves something extraneous. We have to go within first. We have to transform first. We have to correct. Now here's an interesting teaching that you're gonna see hidden throughout the Book of Mormon. It's an ancient teaching called the Shem HaMethlesh, 70, 72 names of God, or sometimes called the explicit name of God. And you'll see it here referenced. This is while they're in the cavity of the rock in a place of correction. And what does he say? And it came to pass that I spoke unto my brethren, saying, Let us go up again into Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a symbol for the heart. And let us be faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. For behold, he is mightier than all the earth. Why not mightier than Laban and his fifty, or even his tens of thousands? Therefore, let us go up, and let us be strong like unto Moses. For he truly spake unto the waters of the Red Sea, and they divided hither and thither. And our fathers came through out of captivity on dry ground. And the armies of Pharaoh's, of Pharaoh did follow and were drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. Notice why does he quote the scripture here? You think it was just a motivational talk? Come on, guys. No, God give it to Moses. He came down. He parted the Red Sea. He's going to do it for us. Rah, rah, rah. Go, team, go. No, no, no. He didn't do that. He's using a technique called Remes. He's referring us to another scripture. This name is called the Shem HaMephoresh, the 72 names of God. It is passed down in various, di various disciplines in Israel. But make no mistake, it is attributed to the prophet Enoch. But was considered the power or the gift by which Moses parted the Red Sea, and by which all prophets in Israel obtained their prophetic knowledge and manifested the gifts of God. Where does it come from? Well, let's take a look at the scripture that Nephi is quoting, Exodus 14, verse 19. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood before them. In this word, in this particular verse, there are exactly 72 letters. Okay, I want you to remember that. This is just this first verse. Second verse, verse 20. And it came to pass between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that one came not near to the other all night. The second verse, exactly 72 letters. Hmm. Third verse, verse 21, and Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Third verse, exactly 72 letters. The only place in the Torah that you will ever see this. However, I have discovered there is one other place. And it's, I'll give you a clue. I'm not going to tell you today what it is, but I'll, tell you, I'll give you a clue, and you see if you can find it in the Book of Mormon. 
I don't find the place in the Book of Mormon, and it's only in one chapter, where you find the sequence. And he came, and he traveled, and he pitched or stretched. Same word in Hebrew. When you get your homework, find that phrase. Nephi preserved it, but you have to go back. You have to re retro-translate it into the Hebrew to get the exact same. But what, I'm going to make it easy. We're going to skip ahead a little bit. So what are these 72 names? If I combine the first letter of the first verse with the last letter of the second verse, and then go back to the first letter of the first verse, they combine to form literally 72 names of God. Now these names are not names like Tom, Dick, or Harry. They are part of an ancient prophetic practice and discipline of where the person begins to resonate a calling upon the name or meditating upon it through contemplative meditation with the, these aspects of the Spirit of God that these names represent. All of these 72 names are extensions of the four-letter name. And you're probably going, what in the world are you talking about, Robert? Four-letter name, yod heh vav -Heh. These things are numeric extensions of that four-letter name. They represent attributes of God. As a person calls upon them, vocalizes them, then they, they begin to resonate with it. It's actually considered one of the disciplines called feasting on the name, also called feasting on the word. Obtain the record of heaven. So, now when I had spoken these words, they were yet angry and were still continuing to murmur. They were complaining. Nevertheless, they did follow me and we came without the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a symbol for the heart. So he's giving you, first he tells you you're going into your head for a place of correction. He's giving you a very ancient prophetic tool by whereby a person transforms and connects with the power of God, the Spirit of God. Not just in its brief element, but to transform you from within, to cleanse the vessel from within so that it can be filled by God to bestow love upon others. So what did he do? Well, to obtain this record, this ancient record, he had to go, he came outside the walls of Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is your heart. And it was by night, and it caused that they should hide themselves outside the wall. And after they hid themselves, I, Nephi, crept into the city and went forth to the house of Laban. And there he finds him. But notice, Lephi, Nephi does not premeditatively murder Laban. He's already laying there. God had delivered him into his hands. And in fact, if you read that scripture, I'll type it in here. No. If you read that scripture, God quotes the Torah. Behold, I have delivered him into your hands. Exodus 21, 12. Behold, if I deliver him into your hands and you lie not in wait, nevertheless it shall be unto you according to what as you shall do. It's one of the laws of the Goel Hadam. So God is, even as God commands Nephi to slay Laban, he's quoting the Torah to him. So what Nephi is doing is according to the Torah and the, you know, the law and the testimony. In other words, he not only has the voice of God, God's even quoting him the Torah and telling him what to do. But he didn't sit there, how am I going to premeditatively kill Laban? He just was going for the plates. Which is very strange because you'll, it, with the knowledge of the Torah, we begin to understand that God is perfectly consistent with his commandments. He does not break his commandments. If we have an understanding of why he did what he did. I can see why people come to this conclusion that, well, God commanded Nephi to kill Laban, therefore murder is okay, if God commanded it. No, God commanded Nephi to enact the laws of the Gula Hadam. And if you even look at the strict interpretation of the, of the outlay, the outline of the way Laban dealt with Nephi, he fulfilled each one of the requirements so that Nephi could enact that law. So God is perfectly consistent with his law. And what does he do? He takes a sword, and he ta takes Nephi, the sword of Laban, the sword of the being of supernal whiteness, and he cuts off Laban's own head with that sword. Just like Goliath's sword, the sword of Laban represents the teachings of the upper worlds. These are what are needed to cut off the authority of the adversary that keeps us from the record of heaven. The sword of Laban is equal to the teachings of the upper worlds. It's actually a pattern of the tree of life, with the top of the sword being Keter, the crown, 
And you see chokmah, wisdom, bina, understanding, chesed, mercy, gavura, severity, justice, power. Like and you talked about earlier, justice and power, justice and mercy being basically the same thing. And in a sense, that's really what they are. They're like the rungs of a ladder. They're just two sides of the same stick. Tiferet, beauty or balance. Netzach, not suffering. Chod, glory. Yesod, foundation. And of course, where we live, Nakut, this kingdom. Zoram represents the guardian of the treasury of heaven. No one gets into that treasury of heaven. Only a mighty angel can get into the treasury of heaven. So what did Levi have to do? He had to done the, the garments of labor. He had to transform into a mighty one to obtain that gift, which is what we have to do. We have to use these same teachings to transform so that we can obtain access to this record of heaven. It is a lot more than just uh, putting someone's hands on somebody's head and saying, receive the Holy Ghost. This is an act of discipline and meditation and prayer where you go within to obtain access to something that each and every one of us already has access to. That actual veil that we think is a veil is an illusion. It's an illusion that we have accepted in this creation. But we're the ones who can have access to that treasury. So after slaying his adversary, Nephi transforms himself, like I said, and he, and he enters the celestial treasury, the Otser in Hebrew, and refers to the source of every human soul. In his new identity as a mighty one, Nephi is able to pass by the servant who holds the keys of his treasury. And then you'll begin to see that all these things begin to be to come into one. The tree of life, the sword of Laban, the four-letter name of God. Now, lest you think that I'm lying, this occurs again. When Nephi calls forth the power of God upon his brothers while he's building a ship, he actually draws upon Exodus 14, 19, 21 again. Know you not that Moses was commanded of the Lord to do that great work? And you know that by the, his word, the waters of the Red Sea were divided hither and thither, and they passed through on dry ground. But you know that the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea, who were the armies of Pharaoh. Notice in the calling forth of the power of God there, he evokes the same scripture of the Torah that contains the 72 names of God. But wait, there's more. There's actually one I skipped here. It's actually an Alma, but I skipped over it. But um, here's one in Helaman 8. Here, Nephi, in the book of Helaman, this is where he discovers, he makes, he made, you know, he reveals who actually killed, I believe, the chief justice, the judge in this case. And uh, they're like, how does this guy know this? They're trying to rail against him. And it says, um, therefore, he was constrained to speak more unto them. Behold, my brethren, have you not read that God gave power, Gavura, unto one man? even Moses, to spite upon the waters of the Red Sea. And they parted hither and thither, insomuch that the Israelites, who were our fathers, came through on dry ground. And the waters closed upon the armies of the Egyptians and swallowed them up. Now behold, if God gave unto this man such power, why should you dispute among yourselves and say that he hath given me no power, whereby I may know concerning the judgments that shall come upon you, except you repent? Notice in talking about the gift of prophecy, he evokes the same scripture. Interestingly not, same connection here, the brother of Jared in the names. And it came to pass at the end of four years that the Lord came again unto the brother of Jared and stood in a cloud, which is a hint back also to uh, Exodus 14, 19, 21, where God stood forth in a cloud and talked with him. And for the space of three hours did the Lord talk with the brother of Jared and chastened him because he remembered not to call upon the name of the Lord. Do we honestly think that in four years time, he never said a prayer? Ever. A man who walked and talked with God, even before he even saw him, that he didn't pray in four years. Either he was really ticked off and had issues, or he's talking about something else. And in this case, to call upon the name of the Lord is this actual practice of working what we call working in the names. Until a person becomes the master of the great name. And when they become master of the great name, what happens? The Messiah reveals himself to them. It has happened even since the days of Israel. There have been other, other masters of the great name who recorded not only have, having used this, attributing it to Moses' teaching, but having come into the presence of Messiah. 
I guess they're the only ones you're going to know unless we ourselves find out. We also talk about this, and, and I find the same interesting comparative thing here. Oliver Cowdery, this is when he was trying to translate. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that as surely as the Lord lives, who is your God and your Redeemer, even so surely shall you receive a knowledge of whatsoever things you shall ask in faith with an honest heart, believing that you shall receive a knowledge concerning the engravings of old records, which are ancient, which contain those parts of my scriptures which have been spoken by the manifestation of my spirit. Yes, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Hmm, Holy Ghost, record of heaven, which shall come upon you and shall dwell in your heart. Hmm, Jerusalem. Now behold, this is the spirit of revelation. Behold, this is the spirit by which Moses brought the children of Israel through the Red Sea on dry ground. Hmm. God directing him again to that same scripture, Exodus 14, 19 to 21. Now, not to beat be a point, but let's take a look at the New Testament. Would it be there? We would think that God would be consistent. And a lot of times we read these accounts as if they're literal accounts, and they are literal but they're often communicated in such a way to teach us something else. So when God sends out the 70, or is he sending out the 72? According to the oldest manuscripts, God did not send out, Jesus did not send out the 70, he sent out the 72. After the Lord, appointed, the Lord had appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And the Lord said, the harvest, he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Where Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. And he, and he tells them, you know, to go forward. They return. Notice what he says. And the 72 return with joy. You'll see this. In the, they actually corrected this in the ESV and the NLT uh, versions of the Bible. They'll say the 72, not the 70. Or you'll at least see a footnote. Um, the 72 returned, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And I said to them, I saw, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, the lightning strike of God. He's actually having power to cast out. These men have obtained power to cast out the adversary. And behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Serpents and scorpions are also a, a name of the, basically adversarial angels and uh, warring, people, warring parties. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Now, did he really send forth 72 or 70 on a shot level? You bet he did. But at the same time, it's written in such a way to communicate, again, from the New Testament, this idea of the 72 names. Well, what's interesting about this the most is there was an ancient teaching passed down you know, among two sects of Jews. One, uh, two sects of Judaism, one was the Sephardic as well as the Ashkenazi. Principally, this was uh, this particular teaching called the Warring of the Lions was preserved by Moshe ben Nachman, the Rambam. Talked about, and it's specifically called the Warring of the Lions. The 72 letter name is composed of 216 letters. Okay, remember that number, 216. Okay, the word itself equals strength or judgment or gavura one of the attributes of the tree of life. It equivocates numerically to 216. It also equivocates to the word aria, lion, 216. So while gavura can also mean power or just in generic, a, a, a very powerful person or force, it also has a relationship to the roaring of lions. So 72 letter name, often called the voice of angels, the language of angels, the names of the angels, the 72 angelic realms, being referred to as principles of power, being referred to as lions. And here we have something interesting in the Pearl of Great Price. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and their enemies came to battle against them, and he spoke the word of the Lord. And he spoke the word, word of Jehovah. And the earth trembled, and fountains fled, even according to his command. And the, and the rivers, of, that's supposed to be rivers of waters, were turned out of their course. And the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness. And all nations feared so greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. So if you take a look closely here in the Moses, 
which so many anti-Mormons seem to have such a problem with, you find amongst the most ancient doctrines preserved in Israel to this day. The roaring of the lions, the language of angels. Enoch had the language of angels. The 72 letter name is connected to what we call the language of angels. And what shall you do after you enter in by the way? Behold, angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Do they really speak the words of Christ? More so than we think. So when we come down to it, one of the things I wanted to have you take a look at is to remember that a lot of times when we go through the scriptures, especially the Book of Mormon and even the Torah, we're given children's stories. But in those stories are couched messages and teachings from the ancient world that we are meant to receive by learning to use these things we can then begin to, to tap the same source. And if you notice up here, I think, uh, this. I think we it. yeah, okay, yep, yeah, we did it. <laughs> Unless you think this is so weird. Raise your hands, I've been through the temple. Okay, good, you're all heretics too, cool. So, um, up, you'll see, up here on the board, you'll see the, the letter Aleph. You already know some of these names already. You just don't know that you know them or that you have used them. For example, Aleph. There's an ancient prayer in Hebrew called the Aleph prayer, okay? If I want to connect heaven and earth, how do I do that? Well, the letter Aleph is the letter that connects heaven and earth. But to call, to, to meditate or pray using, contemplating upon the letter Aleph is me ascending to heaven. But if I want to bring heaven to earth, I reverse it and it's pronounced Hey, lay, el. Unless you think Mormons had a thing on that, it's in the Sefer Yetzirah, it's in the Zohar, it's also in the Bahir. Guess what? It's, in the, it's, in, it's also in the Torah. It's just in the Hebrew. And the L part tells me whoever, created, whoever gave it that extension knew exactly which school they were doing it from because they got it from the Abulafian school, which is that prophetic tradition that preserved the extension of putting angelic endings of El or Yah on the end of the names to help you pronounce them. But it was a meditative prayer practice. Now, let's go back for just a second, and I'll see if we can do this a little bit closer. Let's see if I can do it. Maybe I can do it from there. Yeah, I know you can't see this, but from the right to the left, starting at the top, the first name is the first two letters, second, third, and then fourth, and then the fifth. I want you to pay specific attention to that fourth and fifth one. The fourth letter, uh, the fourth name, Elame. That's Elame. Ain Lamed Mem. You've heard that name before. You've also heard the fifth one. Memheshim, Meheshi. Or let's permute it just a tad. Moshia, Mosiah. Alma, Elame. These are Hebrew word constructs. Interesting that this is for the word of an angel. And notice that Alma was taken by the hand of the Lord like Moses. He was a translated or angelified being. Did it happen by accident that we already have two of the names in the Book of Mormon? What if I were to tell you that they're all in there? And in fact, if the science has been encoded into it to teach you how to use it. The hard part about it, we are so culturally and linguistically at a disadvantage in our American culture, we have to dig them out. But once we do, the Lord begins to add more and more and more. Today, I've given you just the 72 names. You heard them actually play, uh, playing right at the very beginning. That was a song, playing them to you. Yes, sir. Robert, I just want to remind you that Joseph Smith made this up after he I know, right? I know. And that's why I say, when, when you look at these things, I, I, when people sit there and tell me, oh, Joseph, Joseph Smith just made this all up, I'm going, do you know how galactically stupid that you actually sound to a Jew? Who reads this stuff and goes, uh, sorry, it would be next to impossible to encode this type of thing. When you see words in the Book of Mormon like unfolded, you're being given a, a prophetic key of how you are meant to read the scriptures. Go look that word up when you get a chance. Look the number of times that it, pre that it presents itself. Look at where it's being taught. Not only are you meant to read it from top to bottom, you're also meant to read it from bottom to top, from right to left and left to right in the Hebrew. And as you take the words 
and you put them back and forth, you will get a different story. I'll give you an example. Uh, Jacob chapter 4, right before the parable of Zenos. And he talks about the sure foundation, okay? And uh, the stone upon which the builders, how should they ever build again on the sure foundation? Well, the sure, the sure foundation, sure is amen, foundation is Yesod. But amen is the numerical equivalent of Adonai Yehovah. We have shared the same numerical equivalency. So how again shall they ever build upon Yehovah Adonai, Yesod, their foundation? Well, let's go a step further. Now let's reverse it. Instead of, uh, like, for example, the word uh, sure foundation, it also has the, it'll also find it in, in, its, in its build, the word backward, with the word stone. Eb, stone, Eben, son of the father. Reverse it, Nadi, prophet. Yeshua was the prophet who was to come like unto Moses. He was also the sure foundation and the stone. How will they ever build upon him? And the build upon him, by the way, is not what you think. You are not building on the foundation stone of the building. You are building up to a capstone to be capped down. He is the cornerstone. And in Hebrew, that's, uh, how does he say it? That's uh, not pinnip. It's the pinnacle, but the way it's, it's been Hebrew, it's like pinale or sorry, the pinale. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Pinnacle. It's the capstone. Imagine like a, a, a imagine like say a, uh, a pyramid. It's the capstone of the pyramid. You're building, you're ascending or building the structure up till you reach the capstone. How shall again shall you ever reach the capstone? We get, a, we, we get our pictures mixed up because we think, oh, cornerstone, Salt Lake Temple. He means the stone up here on the southeast edge where everything is built upon that stone. No, you've already built the structure. He's the, he's the capstone, the chief or cornerstone, which the builders rejected. He becomes the chief or corner. He becomes the capstone. Everything in about Zenos' parable, while it's also about the, the scattering and gathering in the house of Israel, is also about the condescension of God, the descent down the tree of life, and it's a set back up the tree of life. When you see these code phrases in, in the Book of Mormon that are also found in the Torah, my father dwelt in a tent, dwelt in a tent, remember, remember, um, unfolded. Even the word mysteries, so it's even, he's telling you flat out. You'll begin to see many of these ancient teachings in the Book of Mormon couched, meant to both reveal and conceal. There will be people who could care less about what I'm talking about, and they'll never want it. But for those who do, it's there. The technology is there. Now, the question, of course, is how to use the technology. And I think I'm about out of time, so we may have to get that next time. Are there any questions? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah. But you don't think about it. Alma, Mosiah, you already know two of the names. Four and five. The others, okay, the, the cheater's way to do it is to go directly to Exodus 19, uh, 14, 19 to 21. Oh, I'm working on that. I've actually worked on a spreadsheet and I'll send it to you. They're all there. I just got to finish putting them all down in the order because I'm actually doing it in the order in which they appear, according to the thing here, uh, the scripture that they're in, and which prophet and the names that they actually coincide with, because by the way, they're all there. So it's interesting. So I, I, I'm almost done. So let's see here. Uh, okay. Please elaborate on the masculine and feminine principles. Okay. So God, or the tree, or as represented by the tree of life, is both masculine and feminine. It is not one above another, it is one side by side in a dynamic tension. The goal is not for one to overly pull in one direction. For example, if I consider that we go too far to want to the, to the masculine pillar, I'm gonna get tyranny because it's highly structured. Men are structured. We like order, structure, power, we, you know, we got that down. The female or the feminine principle is grace, beauty, those kind of things. If I go too far to the feminine pillar, I get chaos. If the, if the two keep going fighting back and forth with each other, the pendulum swing between the two back and forth will destroy who's ever in the center. This is why you have such problems with divorce. It's why you're seeing the destruction of our nation. We are going to such 
polar opposite extremes so quickly, our, we cannot adjust anymore. Wickedness to try to go to set apartness, wickedness back and forth to set apartness, boom, 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 and then it tears everybody apart. The goal is not about polarizing at one side, masculine or the feminine. It's about reaching the, the state of balance or oneness in the center. So I hope that answered the question. Let me get this. Says, Can you elaborate more on the number 70 versus 72 in the scriptures? Is at 70 ever the correct number? Yes, it actually is. If you understand that while there were 70 nations, um, there were two governing witnesses, nations that stood as witnesses, which is always an interesting thing. So yes, for example, you could say at the time of the Tower of Babel, um, the Jaredites could serve as a witnessing nation, even though there were 70 nations. You could also say, for example, when at, the, at Shavuot, when the tongues of the 70 nations were spoken, you have Israel and the mixed multitude. So there are different ways in which different schools portray it. But the idea is that while you are having 70 actual nations, which is representative, it's not actual, doesn't mean like specifically just 70, in the sense of you can, I mean, at least it's 70, but the idea is there's a multitude of nations, but there are two witnessing nations. You'll see this same teaching when um, Moses came down and they established a tabernacle. And this is, I think this is in, it's either Numbers of Leviticus, I'll speak to the chapter, but he places the, um, 70, two by two around the tabernacle. And then there's two men who stay out in the camp. And this is where he gets, this is Joshua says, my Lord, Melda and Mida do prophesy in the camp. Forbid them. People think, you know, it's just forbid them completely. But you have two of these, of these men who had observed the face of God who were still within the camp. Just like there were two of, of the 75 that came down into Egypt, Israel being one, Jacob, Israel being one of them, Two passed away, leaving you 72. So at the end of the day, these, these, these teachings are, are encrypted in various stories. Um, so yes, there is 70. 70 is a number. But you'll usually see that hidden two somewhere pretty close to it. Numbers 11, is that what it is? Yeah, I think it's somewhere in there. We're in the Lord's hands. Yes, and if, oh yes, by the way, who clothed this? I want to hook to the scripture. You're, that's what I was talking about. Oh, that's good. So it's Genesis 46, 27. By the way, read it in the Septuagint at 75, then track the numbers out. Okay, okay that's where it comes from. <laughs> okay. Can you show us the slide again with the seven laws? Yes, I can. Somewhere. There we are. So those are the ancient laws. You will actually find these laws mentioned both in the Book of Mormon and uh, the DNC. They may not be enumerated the exact verbally, but I actually have wrote an article. If, you're, if you want to go, it's actually on my, my blog, uh, mormonyeshiva.blogspot.com, where I actually show where each of these ancient laws is found in the Book of Mormon, DNC, and Pearl of Price. So you can all have it. It's uh, Mormon Yeshiva, I-E-S-H-I-V-A, dot blogspot.com and you can see yourself now here's a funny thing so about three weeks ago i was having a discussion with a friend of mine who's a member of the cherokee nation because my mom technically is a legal member of the cherokee nation so it was a friend of mine that i met down here there he was a mormon but he's also a full-blooded cherokee we were talking about the 72 names and i started talking to him but he says robert you know we have those already in our in our they have their like a chant, they held, they held another word. And it caught my attention because the way he said it. But like, for example, when you pronounce the first letter word, wa he wa you know, and then, then they literally go down and, and they pronounce, they have a tradition of these same, these same words in their particular tradition. So I think you're going to find these things in varying cultures. It would not surprise me to see these things preserved among some Native American cultures as well. So when he told me that, I was like, my, my jaw was hitting the floor. So, <laughs> so let's see. Uh, and where did you find these? Okay. Now, this is a good one. So where do you find these laws? Two places that you can find them. In Hebrew literature, uh, there's, well, excuse me, three. Sefer Raziel, which is a book attributed to the angel Raziel that was given to Adam. Sefer Yatsira, which is attributed to Abraham and the Bahir. And yet you'll also find these same laws in their principle enumerated 
both in the Torah and in our modern Book of Mormon, DNC, whatnot. They are there. Um, but the three original places in, the, in Israelite literature where, where it's specifically spelled out are the Sefer Yetzirah and the Behir and Raziel. And no one really knows who Raziel, I mean, it's supposed to be an angel, but it's supposed to be a book that was delivered to Adam that he was given to his children. But we don't have all of it. It's just a, it's just a fraction of it. Oh, R-A-Z-I-E-L. <laughs> and Yetzirah, Y-E-T-Z. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out here after the fact. How's that? I can do that. Um, let's see. What is the record of heaven? Okay, so the record of heaven, let me go back just a little bit, somewhere in here. I think I'm going the right way. So the record of heaven. So everything on earth is a type and shadow of that is in heaven. So the Torah or the Tanakh is a type and shadow of every record. Sometimes called the Book of Life, sometimes called the, uh, the Book of Yehovah. Um, in this case, the Record of Heaven. Um, it, it's basically the way I can describe it is imagine. I know this sounds really modern and horrible to say. I'm going to evoke the Force here, but it's the Force. It's basically the idea of sometimes you'll call it Akashic Records, you'll call it um, uh, the Force, you may call it the Holy Ghost, Prana, whatever. They're all basically the same concept. What it is, is that there is, in, the, in, in heaven, there is a place where all knowledge, past, present, and future is stored, which we actually have access to. We're the ones that cut ourselves off from it because we believe in an illusion. And, uh, oh, and then actually, I, read, I think the record of heaven is a Kashi record, book of life. Actually, yes, that was it. <laughs> I didn't see that. Yes, that's exactly right. Which one? Sorry, you bet. How's that? Okay. Yes, Rhonda. Yeah. I, you know, I have no problem because Metatron, who is equated with Enoch, sits by the, the treasury of heaven. So uh, Enoch often gets equated with the, the angel Metatron, which, by the way, is not a Hebrew name. It's a, it's a Greek name, yeah, which is interesting to me. But the same concept we get both from uh, the Corpus Hermeticum as well as the writings of Toth, which we hope are completely legitimate. <laughs> but what's interesting is that he is often equated as the keeper of the vault or as the keeper of the treasury. But Enoch was angelified. And what's interesting is that many of the angelic names that he gave it, that we have in the records of Enoch are the 70, are parts of the 72 names that he reveals. Because in Hebrew, in understanding the idea of an angel, we think of just angel as, a, as one person, like the angel Moroni. But in actuality, the Hebrew is a little bit more, a little bit broader than that. It can be an individual or it's a class of beings. So there are 72 different classes of beings. And the idea that these names, um, as we contemplate, pray, and meditate upon them, we become to resonate. Just like the same teaching as when a person reads the words of the scriptures, their spirit begins to resonate with the spirit that wrote those scriptures in the first place, called feasting upon the word or feasting upon the seed, same concept. Um, so yeah. Here's mud. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, in the early, the early church press, and it's a long time that people kind of read the writings and refer to the Old Testament phrase before. Mm -hmm. Why all the rapture? And you had mentioned the coming of the past great Yes. Is there any connection with that? Or why is it? What's, what's the word great? Well, I, you know, I know in Mormon theology, we often, we, we differentiate between the great Jehovah and then we think of Christ being like the Father and the Son. That's not too far off from the idea of like Jehovah and Jehovah Katan, which means a smaller or lesser. It's the same, for, it's the same concept from the Tree of Life that we call uh, Arikanten, the large face of God, meaning the Father, 
and the Zeran pen, the small face of God, meaning the sun, which is at the center of the tree of life. And then there's us down here, which gets the Holy Ghost. So even the tree of life itself is representative of the top, the Father, the middle part, the Son, and the base is the Holy Ghost, or the Ruach Elohim, that extends from that. And whereas at the very top of the tree, called Worlds Without End, or Ein Sof. So when he talks about in DNC 76, and where God and Christ come, worlds without end, they can never come. He's not saying, that, that is not an element of time saying they're never going to come here. What he's saying is where God and Christ are, Ein Sof, in the eternities, they cannot come, doesn't mean forever. So it's, I think more or less to try to answer your question would be, there is a, in, in pre-Masoretic text, there was a unique distinction made between Yehovah and Yehovah Katan. We no longer have it because the, the, it was altered. That's right. Yeah. You made it singular, yeah. And that's very true. So, yeah, so I agree with you. I think there's obviously more there. And at the same time, if you look at the, even the names of the angels, it's not just considered singular. It could be also a group, like Elohim could be a group of people or a group of beings, just like a group of or a class of beings with the names. Yes, Marian? Can you call upon the name? Okay. Are you including the name's characteristics and also the fact that? And what is the name? Okay. So the name is the. Go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. So uh, I understood the correction, question correctly. You want to know what, what does call upon the name mean, what name, and how these other names play into that? Is that a good summary? Okay. So the name is the four letter name of God, Yod Heh Vav Heh. And if I go back somewhere near, maybe, somewhere, maybe I lied. <laughs> There we go. Calling upon the name. So if you'll notice right there, uh, it's called the Tetractus. The four-letter name of God at the very base, but if we take it apart numerically, Yod, yod He, yod He Vav, yod He Vav He, the total numerical, numerical equivalent is 72. Okay, represented the 72 names of God. So the actual name that we are always calling upon is yod He Vav He. Now, there were different types and different, there were different disciplines. We've talked about one today with the 72 names. There was an older one that is considered your first primer in the, in the school of the prophetic. It was, to, was to, to literally meditate or call upon the name Yehovah Adonai. But how you did it was to call upon the name Amen. The great God of heaven has a name by which he will be called. It is Amen. Equivalents to the number 91 in Hebrew. Adonai, Yehovah, equivalents to 91 in numeric value in Hebrew. So the idea how they would do it is they would either, they would, they would, they would, you never would, act, according to straight Jewish principles, you never actually pronounce the name. So I would be a heretic. And uh, so yod he vav he, you would actually mentally say that or, ver or visualize the letters, uh, Adonai, and then you would say uh, verbally, Amen. And then that's how they would pray over and over again. Um, the idea is similar to a mantra, very similar to a mantra. Three letter, the three, the three letter um, 72 names, or were used so much, so much mantras, two at a time. Christ sent them forth two by two. The seal of Solomon separates them out as how he called upon them, two by two names at a time. Interesting that you see the pattern in there. Yes, Nathan. Can you speak to uh, Mosiah giving the people a name and also... Like Mosiah giving, a, so you speak to Mosiah giving the people a name. And what was the second part? And, the, and also the and the endowment, like the new name or the endowment, or? Okay, so, yeah, that's the hard questions. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much time I have left. I'm probably out of time, right? <laughs> you want time. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes, I need two. Okay, so there's one time of year where God places his name upon the people, and it occurs around the Feast of Tabernacles. Why do you think that the people there were intense around the tower that he erected it was a feast of tabernacles and he places the name upon them 
Now, traditionally, that's done by the Aaronic blessing. May God bless you and keep you, may his face to shine upon you that way. Um, but the idea of placing or giving them a name, he then gives them the name of Yeshua, which is interesting. He actually gives them that name, Yeshua Mashiach. But the idea of giving names, names are words of power. It seems strange to us. In the scriptures, like the name Solomon, Davi, um, Jacob, Israel, Avraham, Avinadai, Ether, all those names, these are words of power. Although they're people, people were given these word names and these words of power. Whoever wrote the Book of Mormon, Moroni Mormon, whoever wrote that part of it, man, for, for somebody that, that really was making all this up, he's encapsulated things in such a unique Hebraic manner that there is no group of rabbis that could have composed this the way it's meant. And there's no way possible that Joseph Smith ever could have made this up. It's not mentally or physically possible to do what is in this book. And that's what people understand. The reason they approach the book, the reason people are so busy scoffing and rejecting the Book of Mormon is because they're approaching it like Gentile Christians, not Israelites, not Torah-observant Israelites. Because if we truly examine it as an Israelite document, it fulfills its mission very well. It's meant to restore the house of Israel. As part of those things, we are meant to be given plain and precious things. Plain, meaning a pathway, not necessarily just self-evident, although that's one of its shot level meanings, but plain in the sense of it gives us a pathway. Precious, meaning betrothal gifts, migdana, betrothal gifts. When you look in the Book of Mormon, if it has plain and precious things, it's telling you it's got a pathway for you. And it's got gifts, just like Rebecca was given precious things to be brought to Isaac, the betrothed son, she was given precious things. What are the betrothal gifts that the Book of Mormon gives us? And I submit to you the 72 names, and there are other things there, but even the 72 names is one of those gifts. To, put, to transform us. We go to a temple, and we do the true order of prayer, and we call upon a name that nobody knows where it comes from, but we do it out of memorization. Although most places now, they've even taken it around completely. Not knowing where it came from. Not knowing what they had. But if you're given a gift and it's there in the book and you begin to use it and to transform yourself to become a vessel to receive, to bestow, or in other words, to love God and to love your neighbor, then God bestows exponentially. He doesn't stop bestowing. He fills us up to the limit and he causes our vessel to transform to obtain even more. We're the vessel. We just need the tools to do it. We sit here and tell people, repent, do this, do better, do this. And we turn the gospel into a self-help group that never works. That's because it does, it's not meant to be done. It says, no man does good, no, not one. Say they should work by the power and gifts of God. Good, told, fulfilling the covenant, fulfilling God's commandments. None of us can fulfill the God, God's commandments. Not one of us. Lest he should work by the power and gifts of God. How do I work by the power and gifts? Look at Moroni 10. Tree of life, every gift equates with one of the sephirah, the branches of the tree of life. Start at the bottom, not at the top. Receive the interpretation of tongues. But the tongues he's referring to isn't Hebrew or Chinese. It's the tongues of angels. And then we go from the interpretation of tongues to being able to speak with the tongue of angels, to beholding, the of angels, beholding angels. And we ascend ourselves up the tree, not by our own grace, but by God's grace, not because of our own energy, we can't do it. It takes an outside force of much greater power to transform us like the philosopher's stone, which is also a symbol for the pearl of great price, to do a, a spiritual alchemy, a spiritual transformation. So I hope that that was worth your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and I hope that it'll at least give you enough to start exploring and asking questions for yourself because, oh boy, can I tell you, there's so much more in this book. This is just one betrothal gift. So much more. So much more knowledge and understanding waiting to be unlocked. It truly is a sealed book. Take some time. Unlock it. It's there for you. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.